Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Time now for another uh, edition of uh, Clinging to God and Guns with Pastor John Bennett. Uh, Pastor Bennett rejoins us for uh, a little bit of fun here with uh, an article from Red Letter Christians called America's Gun and Heart Problem. Welcome back, Pastor. Thank you. Pleasure to be back. All right, let's get started. This is from Shane Claiborne from October of last year, so it's relatively recent. Um, this was in response to the um, the shooting at the Umpqua Community College in Oregon. So uh, here we go. This week's tragedy struck Oregon as 26-year-old, I'm not going to mention his name, massacred nine people at Umpqua Community College. And this week marked the anniversary of the Nickel Mines Massacre in Pennsylvania. Both are reminders that we have a crisis in America. We have 4.4% of the world's population but almost half of the civilian-owned guns. I didn't source that. Um, I'm not sure where that one actually came from. I've come across this before, and it, it's pretty close. Uh, we've got 42% of the world's guns. So America winning once again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, i trying to... What is the source for this? Oh, it's Vox. And that ought to tell you something. Um In just the last three years, we've had nearly a thousand mass shootings, and there's that statistic, which there's no real good um, uh, definition for what a mass shooting is, so of course the left basically uses whatever definition fits their political agenda. Right, right. Well, and what's interesting too is that many of these mass shootings, uh, they are committed by I, uh, it's, it's cases of gang violence, like what we see in Chicago. Right. And it also includes um, familicides. So you've got, um, you know, murder suicides. That counts as a mass shooting, um, which certainly would shouldn't. Uh, it's not the same thing as, say, Newtown or the Umpqua Community College shooting or even the Nickel Mines Massacre. It's, you know, some guy who loses his mind, gets depressed, and decides to kill his whole family. Completely different thing. Right, right. Um, Killing over 1,200 people and wounding over 3,500, there is a mass shooting almost every day in America with four or more victims. In fact, we hold the Guinness Book of World Records for the most guns, nearly 300 million guns. Yay, America. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, I think that's a win for us. But anyway, that's 90 guns for every 100 people. Um, the runner up is India with four guns for every hundred people. We have a problem over 11,000 murders a year and about twice that many suicides from guns. And here's where, um, you know, I want to, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but the, the guy didn't bother to really research his statistics. Uh, and actually we have more than 300 million guns in the U S um, the, the firearm ownership rate, it's 112 guns per 100 people. He says now, this, this is where I'm, I, I really can't give him the benefit of the doubt because a quick search will tell you that this is blatantly false. He says the runner-up is India with four guns for every 100 people. That's not even close. The runner-up is the country of Cyprus with close to 70. Ah, uh-huh. So, and uh, India is way down on the list of ratio of guns per per hundred people. It um, the, the rank. I'll tell you real quick. India rates uh, number one hundred and seven out of a hundred and seventy five nations. So it is well in the bottom third of the number of firearms owned per hundred people. But just taking a look at his comparison though, and this really gives you a a perfect example of how these statistics actually weigh against arguments in favor of gun control. Um, India has approximately one twenty-fifth of the number of guns per capita, but Hmm. India has a murder rate that's not much different than the U.S. The U.S. has 3.8 murders per 100,000 people. India has 3.5. So the author also makes this big deal about, you know, there's 11,000 murders a year 
India, it's about 43,000. Right, right. So it's, it's just a, a perfect example that the analogy actually demonstrates that firearm ownership is inconsequential to the murder rate. By the guy's rationale, we should have a murder rate of almost 100%. <laughs> Well, this is what happens when you get your statistics from Vox. <laughs> <laughs> Some will argue guns don't kill people, people kill people. The fact is, people with guns shoot people. Sometimes they shoot themselves. The areas of the U.S. that have the highest concentration of guns also have the highest concentration of bloodshed. That's false. That is completely wrong. Let's take a look at the major murder centers centers in this country are the places like Chicago, which have horribly restrictive gun control laws. And yet their violent crime rates are out of this world. Right. Right. There, there is a, a clear, concise corollary between the restrictive level of the gun control laws and the rate of, of violence. You take a state like Texas, your state has a relatively low rate of, of violence. Certainly, there's still violence within the big population centers. Right. But in comparison to the number of people living there, you have a much lower homicide rate, say, in Houston or Dallas than you do in Chicago or Oakland or Detroit. Right. Or Washington, D.C. Right. Oh, well, you know, Chirac hadn't come out yet by the, when this was published, I guess. So he wasn't aware of it. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Right. There's a powerful image in the Bible where the prophets, both Micah and Isaiah, speak of God's people beating their swords into plows, turning their weapons into farm tools. It's an image of transforming the tools that have been used to destroy life into tools that can be used to cultivate life. A number of prominent leaders in the first few hundred years of Christianity pointed to this image of beating swords into plows as evidence by which you would know those who follow Jesus. They insisted that Christians are meant to fulfill that prophecy as the ones who follow the Prince of Peace. Just as Jesus transformed the cross, a terrible instrument of death, into a symbol of life, so Christians are to turn from death to life interrupting everything that destroys life in this world. With exception of those last few words, speaking of Jesus turning the cross into, into a powerful symbol of life, mm -hmm. that is such horrific BS. <laughs> he, he Don't hold comes, back now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Um, I am not aware of a single quote-unquote prominent leader in the first few hundred years of Christianity that has so per, uh, so thoroughly perverted the reference in Scripture of beating swords into plowshares. This is a complete perversion of Scripture the way that he applies this. And to see why, let's take an actual look at Scripture. So he, he mentions Isaiah and Micah. And actually this, this imagery of turning plows into, or, or swords into plowshares, is used three times, once each in Micah and Isaiah. And the context in both passages is very similar, and the context is also very clear. This is a, a perfect example of completely ignoring the context. You know, to use that 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 uh, term that we coined a while back of putting Jesus in a box. Right. Well, since, since it's the Old Testament, we'll say putting God in a box. So let's... <laughs> Let's take a look at these, these actual verses, and I'm going to quote from Micah chapter 4. It says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Now, he takes these words and twists them to try and say that even some of the leaders in the early church use this as, well, people who do this are suddenly fulfilling these prophecies. Wrong. These verses, they're not 
a prophecy regarding how God's people are going to suddenly become pacifists. <laughs> it, these are messianic prophecies. Right. They are describing a spiritual and eternal reality that will be accomplished by the coming of the Messiah. Very appropriate for us to be discussing right after Easter. Right. But what's more is that these words were used in contrast to the nearly constant state of war that God's people were in. So the prophets are, are, are more or less saying, now you are in a constant state of war. But when the Messiah comes, he will bring about an eternal reality of peace. So we really can't apply these verses in any way to, to temporal affairs because they aren't being written in that manner. They're written in such a way that they are prophetic messianic passages about the eternal reality that, that the Messiah would accomplish. In essence, that by the Messiah coming, when our lives are ended, we enter into eternal peace with him. Right. And there now were, here's, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. So there can't be peace on earth until he comes. We we're, we're, we're live in a fallen world, so we're going to experience violence and war and bloodshed until the day of his return. Right, right. And what makes this even clearer is that the, the verses specifically say that uh, you will not learn war anymore. <laughs> it's speaking of a time where there is no violence whatsoever. The only reality in which we find that is a reality without sin. Right. In other words, heaven. But here's where it gets interesting. I, I, those are the, the first two. I mentioned that there are three times this phrase is used. Mm -hmm. And this is from Joel chapter 3. Listen carefully. Tell me if you uh, catch what's different here. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Huh. Let the weak say, I am strong. Well, Did you catch the difference? Wait a minute. That's entirely in reverse. Yes. And this <laughs> is what is conveniently ignored by our, our author here is that <laughs> in, the, in Isaiah and Micah, we have examples referring to these are messianic prophecies referring to the eternal reality of heaven the salvation that is won for us by christ on the cross joel is speaking of a temporal reality mm -hmm. that as part of our reality in this world war is also included in that so he's saying prepare for war turn your plowshares into swords so when we take a this is a, a perfect example of why whenever we are, are taking a look at God's Word, we have to also take a look at the context. The context is speaking in, in Joel chapter 3 of the end times when there will be great turmoil in the world, especially for God's children. Right. So this idea that somehow we have a command from God to take our guns and beat them into gardening tools truly is a blasphemous perversion of God's Word. Again, like you said, putting God in a box, um, making God fit your political agenda. Yes, and, and the thing that, that also bothers me here is that with examples like this, when we have people who claim from a Christian perspective to provide this interpretation, in many ways they are insulting the, the intelligence of their audience because they are assuming that their, their readers aren't going to look into this for themselves that they are going to be so naive as to simply take them at their word. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> they're probably right. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> so back to the article. Certainly we, have, we Christians have lost sight of that vision over the centuries, and we have often been the ones carrying the guns rather than the ones beating on them. Christians have sometimes exchanged the cross of Christ for the sword of Rome or the guns of America. Lord have mercy. But there's a group of Christian blacksmiths who you might consider fundamentalists of the best kind because they are, that's, that's a nice jab, <laughs> because they are taking these swords to plows verses literally. These metal workers known as raw tools, 
Raw is war turned around, after all. <laughs> are literally forging peace. They take donated guns, AK-47s, and handguns, and they heat them up in the forge and beat them into oblivion. Well, and, and the stupid part of this. What? <laughs> <laughs> they say that by doing this, they are forging peace. <laughs> I don't see the peace. How is that working out? It's not. It, I mean, especially just on the, on the back of the terrorist attacks in Brussels, Iraq, and Pakistan, <laughs> their efforts obviously have been uh, gone unnoticed by the radical Muslim terrorist world. They would have been better off to pack those guns up and ship them to the Christians in the Middle East. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And, you know, what's also so, so irritating about this Part of it, of course, I understand it's their ideology. They want to destroy guns. They then take these and provide, they turn these into tools for people to use in poor third world countries. They didn't include that in the, in the article, but I, I read that on the um, organization's website. If you want to provide low cost tools for people living in the third world, take the donated guns sell them, and you can probably buy a hundred times the number of tools. Yes. <laughs> there are plenty of law-abiding citizens mm. who are going to use those firearms responsibly. Yeah, and you'd make so much more money for this worthy cause if the, if the, if the goal was really helping poor people in the third world, which it's not. Let's... No, and, and as purely as a matter of law... These guns wouldn't be, for example, quote unquote, machine guns, as the liberals like to call them, um, because guess what? They couldn't lawfully even hold those firearms unless they were with a, a federally licensed dealer. Right. Um, so it's <laughs> I, I would like to see the, the, the guns that they are they're doing this to. I'm guessing they're a bunch of old high points that no one wanted. <laughs> Those things won't melt down. <laughs> to have... I've teamed up with them over and over. Something just feels right about taking some of these 300 million guns and beating on them. I've beaten on guns alongside victims of gun violence who lost their kids, alongside police chiefs and activists, and alongside a woman named Terry Roberts. Uh, she's the mother of the man responsible for the nickel mine shooting nine years ago. There's something incredibly moving about seeing Terry pick up a hammer and beat on the barrel of a gun. But it wasn't just about the gun. Terry Roberts is a living witness that God is transforming hearts, not just metal. Well, that's that may be true, but it's not through the action of beating on the gun that God is doing the work. Right. You know, and, and I have a, a serious problem with that because... What is the author implying here? He is implying here that a person's heart is transformed by God when they then have the desire to pick up a hammer and beat a gun just like he has. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to skip through the next paragraph because it's just kind of boring and people will fall asleep and stop listening. Um, uh As Terry and I beat on a gun together earlier this year, she reminded me that we don't just have a gun problem, we also have a heart problem. We need God to transform both our hearts and our nation. As we beat on the barrel of that gun, it felt like we were participating in the redemptive work of God in healing hearts and healing streets, beating guns into plows, turning hatred into love. <laughs> First, I would say, yes, we do have a heart problem. However, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this segment, comparing the, the murder rates between India and the United States, as well as the firearm ownership rate, that the heart problem is not a direct correlation to the quote-unquote gun problem. Right. We would have this heart problem still if we had no guns, because we have sin. As long as we live in this world, we will have to deal with the reality of sin. That means that people will have will still have the desire to kill each other. Right. When Cain killed Abel, he didn't need a weapon. He just grabbed a rock. So it's not that we have a, a quote-unquote 
Well, even though I say, yes, we have a heart problem in the sense that we have a sin problem. Right. But where I really take offense is where he says that I felt like we were participating in the redemptive work of God in healing hearts and healing streets. But they're not. But, <laughs> no. And that is so offensive to Christ because he is the one Mm -hmm. does the redemptive work by letting sin be nailed to his body on the cross. If we could do the redemptive work, we wouldn't need him. And if we didn't have him, we would all be eternally lost. But this, yep. this argument is so upsetting to me because it essentially takes the entire argument of, of gun control and tries to equate it to Christ's work for us. Mm-hmm. Yep. As we lament the horrors of massacres like what has happened this week in Oregon and nine years ago in Pennsylvania, let us refuse to choose between false dichotomies like... Like the ones he uses. Like the ones he uses. The fact that we have a gun problem and we have a heart problem. It is The fact is that we have a gun problem and we have a heart problem. It is my prayer that God would heal our heart problem and some of our politicians would have the courage to help heal our gun problem. It's the old liberal mindset that a gun makes a mm -hmm. reasonably sane and law-abiding person suddenly turn into a, a wrathful, vengeful, murderous menace. Right. The gun is some sort of an evil talisman that turn, right. turns people... Otherwise, right. otherwise, good people evil. Meanwhile, we're not going to wait on politicians to turn death into life. We cannot wait. We've got pruning hooks to make. <laughs> <laughs> I added that, sorry. The beautiful thing about the vision of the biblical prophets is that it is the people themselves who start to transform their weapons. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Yeah. No, and we completely debunked that too, that... <laughs> This is prophetic of if anything, what Joel, is going to accomplish. If anything, Joel has people doing the opposite. That's, uh, yeah. uh, eventually, the nations follow and study war no more. Show me where that has ever happened. I would say the nation that decides to study war no more is the nation that is begging the surrounding nations to conquer it. Mm -hmm. The people of God can't wait on politicians, but instead they take the hammer into their own hands. Or the hammer and the sickle. So we're going to keep heating up the forge and inviting folks around the country to bring your guns and beat them into oblivion. After South Africa's revolution, Nelson Mandela told the people of his country, throw your guns into the sea. I couldn't believe they brought Nelson Mandela into this. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that guy was a terrorist. By his own admission. By his own admission. And look at the... And if you're going to bring up South Africa, look at their murder rate. Right. Um, South Africa, I just looked it up. The murder rate of South Africa is 31.9 mm -hmm. murders per 100,000. If you round up the United States, rounding up, that is, it's four. So more than eight times the murder rate. Obviously, Nelson Mandela, <laughs> your strategy doesn't work. Today, as massacres continue almost daily, we have had enough death. We are saying to America, bring your guns to the forge and let's beat them into plows. We have grown tired of death. He talks about massacres occurring daily, and I can't help but think of the recent massacres that have existed both in Paris and in Belgium. And Paris, very strict gun control. Absolutely. Absolutely. The terrorists, they, the terrorists used guns primarily uh, as the tool of murder. Mm -hmm. It didn't stop them. Nope. And in, in Brussels, there was recovered um, AK-47s at the scene, uh, at, at the uh, airport. Right. It didn't stop them. All right. Well, thank you for joining me again. I appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me. All right. We'll be, uh, we'll be back together next week. We've got a, an interesting one from Christianity Today. Um, thank you all for listening and uh, tune in again next week for another episode of Clinging to God and Guns here on Armed Lutheran Radio.